First of all, congratulations for getting through this series. We have been able to deploy a full smart contract that can trade flash loan arbitrage on the Binance Smart Chain for PancakeSwap v3 and PancakeSwap v2. And that's no small thing. That's really cool that you've got that far. So pat on the back. You've also written a lot of tests as well to interact with that smart contract and even deployed it directly to the mainnet. But here in this video, I'd like to talk about some main points from my own personal experience that I think might save you a lot of time and or potentially headaches. Now, I don't want to discourage you from developing further on the blockchain. In fact, I think the blockchain has a lot to offer. But I do have some lessons that I learned along the way that I'm going to share here. The first one being with search. You need to find arbitrage opportunities. And how can you do that? Well, you know how to get pool addresses by literally going to the factory and querying based on these tokens, what is the pool address? So you could write some kind of functional loop that just goes through checking tons of pool addresses that way. You could even do it on PancakeSwap v2 where you can just put in an integer and it'll tell you incrementing from one to, I don't know, a couple million all the different potential pool addresses. And you could check all sorts of arbitrage combinations on those. So there's many ways you can do it. But just pause for a minute and think about that. If you're going to be pulling information about tokens, the amount of decimals, the symbols you're working with, all from the blockchain, performing all these calculations, calling the smart contracts, and you're not running your own full node, then you're actually eating up a lot of API call allowance that you have with whoever your provider is, whether it's the Binance Smart Chain general provider that we've been using, which is very, very slow, and you certainly won't be able to eat through those calculations quickly. Or you might be using something like QuickNode, which is great, but you'll see at the Crypto Wizards YouTube channel how quickly I've eaten into my API allowance there. And so when you're actually scanning and performing a search algorithm to that degree, to that magnitude, going through every possible combination, you really need to be running your own full node to do that. And I've tried to do that with the Binance Smart Chain. And I found it, number one, not worth it because to run your own node on the Binance Smart Chain is ridiculously expensive. You can do it much cheaper on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. And actually, at the time of recording this, you'll notice there is now a full course here on how to run your own full Ethereum node so that you have an unlimited amount of API calls you can make. So I'll just show that to you over here. And this is being hosted right now at Udemy. And right now they've got a sale on as well. So if you're not a member, you can pick this up for pretty cheap. And if you are a member, this is free for you. Remember, you can just go and watch that course. It'll show you how to run a full node. But with that said, just bear in mind, if you're making calls to the blockchain, it's very slow. If you run your own full node for the Binance Smart Chain, it's ridiculously expensive. And not only that, it was almost impossible for me to get it set up right. I didn't have quite the memory I needed for it. It recommends for hardware, you have about 64 gigabytes of memory. I didn't have that. The storage you need is ridiculously high. You need, you know, at least over six terabytes to really have enough bandwidth for that to work, depending on what configuration you're working with on your hardware. And I just felt it really wasn't worth it because when I ran this algorithm to search on the Binance Smart Chain for opportunities, I didn't find any. And so that's something I know I said at the intro as part of going into this course, but it's something I want to reiterate here. If you're going to do this and you do find opportunities, be very careful about how you execute them. So this is coming on to the second point over here, execution. When you are executing your flash loans, there are bots which are listening to every proposed transaction in the pending transactions. I actually show you again how to listen to those pending transactions on your own node here, but you can do it without even running your own node. You can listen for transactions that are happening on the blockchain and decode them and figure out, oh, is this person calling a flash loan contract from a pool on Uniswap v3? You can actually see that happening before that transaction even goes through. Now, because you can see that transaction before it goes through, that means other people can see yours. And so you really need to be discreet about how you call a flash loan transaction because I 
I'm telling you now, if you call a flash loan, if you borrow money using a flash loan, say on PancakeSwap V2, PancakeSwap V3, like I've shown you how, there are MEV bots or maximal extractable value bots that are running. And I know it sounds far-fetched, but this is how it is. They are running and they are searching for your transaction. And the minute they find it, they will front run you. So they will pay more gas or whatever, depending on the size of the flash loan or the arbitrage you found. They will duplicate your transaction, but replace it with their address. And if they, for example, are a validator, they can decide what ordering they want of the transaction. So they can order their transaction before yours, if they are the selected validator for that moment. Therefore, it is not a fair playing field. When you're dealing with flash loan arbitrage, you will notice even at CryptoWizards.net. So for example, here, if I go to CryptoWizards.net and I go here to the ArbScan tool, so you'll notice we actually have this up and running here for Ethereum. People will test this and go, oh, hey, it's simulated a flash loan correctly. It's showing me that it's still profitable. But when I actually go and trade this on mainnet, I'm sorry, I'm not on MetaMask here. But when I go and actually trade this on mainnet, the transaction failed. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons, either because that coin on the actual mainnet was just completely dodgy and the swap didn't work on PancakeSwap v2 or v3. That's potentially an answer. But another answer is somebody front ran you and somebody is preventing you from making that transaction. So when you actually play in the wild on the actual mainnet, it's a different ball game altogether. When it comes to gas, be very clear about how much gas you're spending when you do arbitrage. So even though the flash loan will fail, you're still spending the gas for it to execute the operations to find out that it fails because you have to reward the validators or what used to be miners. People have to get rewarded in Ethereum or in this case, the Binance Smart Chain has always been proof of stake. So the validators have to get rewarded for the work that they're doing. Anyone running a full node needs to get rewarded for running that full node. And so when they're processing your transaction, even if it fails, you're spending gas. And that adds up because arbitrage is about taking small profits and often, usually, some people have made some big wins in arbitrage in the past, but you never really hear of that very much anymore at all. If they're taking small wins and often, it only takes a number of trades to go wrong for all your wins to be wiped out. And that's why, again, for example, using the Crypto Wizards tool, before I even present these as potential opportunities to wizards, I literally simulate on a full node that I'm running that transaction. I simulate it and make sure that it comes back profitable. And that's not, you know, paying some BUSD or in this case, US dollar tether on the smart contract to make sure it all works. No, no, that amount is set to zero. If it doesn't work, it doesn't get shown over here. And so be absolutely ruthless about how you go and determine whether or not you're actually going to place a trade. And so automating this can also be very dangerous. And we've touched on minor or maximal extractable value. Remember, this is funny business like front running or performing sandwich attacks, etc. That's MEV. But we do have an antidote to that as well. So if you go down here to Submarine Sense, um, in fact, I'm going to go over here to the code for code packages and you'll see this, these two submarines. Most people don't know what these are. So if you're learning about what this is, this will really, if you can get your head around this, you will really understand flash loans and smart contracts and everything inside out. But this here is all about not being seen by the front runners, how to submit your flash loan transaction so that others actually can't see it or it's very unlikely they'll become aware of it and you can every now and then set up new contracts so people can't really detect what you're doing and change you know the types that you're using for parameters just so that people find it a lot harder to decode and so this is all about front running there's a link to a youtube video here and this will explain a lot so there's a lot of links here it's all about how to run a submarine send transaction successfully so all of these resources are here and available for you to use. And remember, the whole point of Code Raid is here. In fact, I don't even really know what the whole point of it is, other than I love to code. I spend months, if not years, on some of this for the research. And I like to put it here as a record for other people to use. So the members of Crypto Wizards have access to this. 
people at this channel have also got access to this as well, who have signed up as members. And anything that I do research on or develop, I will be sharing on here as well. I trust that you found the series very useful and interesting. I'm going to be covering a lot about large language models next. One of the best courses, actually the best course I've ever done, was putting together this auto GPT using Rust. And there's a lot happening in the AI space. And I know I've been quiet on that, but there's a lot of work I've actually been doing in that space right now. And a lot of things that aren't covered on YouTube that I'm looking forward to bringing here as well. So I can't wait to bring all of that new material to YouTube. And with that said, until the next one, take care and talk soon.